And now I want to talk about a novel treatment, oxytocin. Oxytocin is the love hormone. And in my experience, it can be very helpful for many who are working to regulate their nervous system. The close interrelationship of oxytocin to antidiuretic hormone in the posterior pituitary is important to understand. And this is the cella tersica, which you may sometimes see on a neuroquant report reported as empty or partially empty. It holds the pituitary. That is where they're located. It was its role with antidiuretic hormone that got me interested in using it in mold patients because one of the symptoms we see frequently in mold patients is frequent urination. So not surprisingly, the receptors for the love hormone are found throughout the body. The magnocellular neurons of the hypothalamus have widespread projections through the central nervous system. Reproductive sites, of course, including the uterus, testes, and placenta, the heart, which is pretty interesting. Receptors are also found in the thymus, the kidneys, the pancreas, bones, and fat cells. All of those are going to be places in which oxytocin can have some benefits. So the physiological targets of oxytocin are the brain and the autonomic nervous system, which can improve cognition and resilience, the cardiovascular system and bones, and oxy also improves metabolism in multiple ways as is protective against breast and ovarian cancer. Oxytocin is profoundly anti-inflammatory, and you can understand that if you just think for a second is how does nature get a woman who's just essentially as my mother used to tell her five kids all over 10 pounds of birth, gave them birth to a pushing out a watermelon, um, is how do you get this woman to turn around from really the pain and discomfort and allow her to recover quickly enough to really want to start loving that bundle of joy and keep it alive? It is oxytocin. And when you think of its role in birth, you can understand how powerful its effects are on the body. Oxytocin is a cardiovascular hormone. And it can improve cardiac work, reduces um, apoptosis and inflammation, and can increase vascular scar repair. Well, what can repair the heart besides a transplant? can be useful for POTS, which is often associated with mast cell. By reducing urinary frequency, it makes it easier to maintain vascular volume, and it decreases the need for compression softings and daily electrolyte fluids. And that's a very important clinical treatment point. This is quite useful for many POTS patients. And recent research suggests that oxytocin increases the production of cardiac stem cells. And think for a second how useful that could be with the epidemic of myocarditis we're all seeing in increased numbers since COVID. Oxytocin um, has a number of GI benefits for the colon, and it absolutely can inhibit colonic mast cells, stabilizing GLIs mast cells, can be pretty useful for colitis. So something to remember is that histamine apparently increases oxytocin released. Remember those magnocellular neurons in the hypothalamus. And it may be useful to remember is then when we're treating with antihistamines, we may be decreasing the endogenous release of oxytocin. It may be a reason to be using both if you have someone on a lot of antihistamines to try and stabilize their mast cells. In the brain, oxytocin has been shown to increase gray matter growth in the hippocampus, as well as reverse some of the damage caused by amyloid plaques. And this obviously suggests it could be useful in the treatment of neurodegeneration such as Alzheimer's. Also, in the blood-brain barrier, oxytocin plays a role with the RAGE receptors, and these RAGE receptors are related to a number of things, number of diseases, including diabetes, atherosclerosis, cancer, pulmonary fibrosis, and it would seem then that oxytocin, with its role in stabilizing the RAGE receptors, could have a role in all these very serious diseases. The uh, Glial cell modulation is another important point that they are the brain's macrophages and underlie neuroinflammation. And quite interestingly, they also modulate release of oxytocin. 
And since most of my mast cell patients do have a sea of blue neuroinflammation, this research implies that oxytocin could be useful in the treatment of neuroinflammation. I would say that it is useful from what I've seen as a glial cell modulator. So oxytocin basically attenuates the activation of the hopefully now infamous amygdala, our fire alarm, which really starts the triggering loop ring of limbic dysregulation, the cascade of stress hormones. So you can see why oxytocin can be incredibly useful in treating PTSD and trauma. And I've mentioned a couple of times, I started using oxytocin for really its simplest of benefits. It just, it decreases frequent urination. That relationship with antidiuretic hormones seems to be real. And frequent urination is a very common symptom of SIRS, and it's quite unpleasant for many people. And many people, when I put them on oxytocin, just continue continued taking it. Uh, they said they were feeling calmer and healthier. I attributed it all to better sleep because they weren't getting up often as night. I had not done all this research, but I did know it was safe and I continued. And many people have been on it for years because they find they just have, they have so many benefits they can tell within their nervous system. Learning about the bones and the anti-carcinogenic stuff is just icing on the cake. Embodied love involves both oxytocin and antidiuretic and hormone, and the development of the hormones began over 600 million years ago. That's a really long time ago, and that just really impresses me is how important oxytocin must be. Dr. Sue Carter is the wife of Dr. Stephen Porges, and she made her reputation studying oxytocin. She has over 300 peer-reviewed articles, and she notes the shared functions of oxytocin and love have profound implications for health and longevity, including the prevention and treatment of excess inflammation and related disorders, especially those occurring in early life and during periods of chronic threat or disease. And um, that early life trauma is very important. And the fact that oxytocin may help is something to really be remembered. This is just a nice chart comparing antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin. Both are necessary for embodiment of biological safety and love. Antidiuretic hormone is both an oxytocin agonist and partial antagonist, so it's a little complicated. The categories are not black and white. In many ways, oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone are quite similar. In several important respects, they do differ. Antidiuretic hormone increases sympathetic arousal, which we usually don't want, and can increase the stress response we definitely don't want. So it's not what we want for regulating mast cells. And looking back, I, I wonder if it was this effect on the autonomic nervous system um, is why desmopressin, which is what I learned to use early in my career in treating mold and, and frequent urination, really didn't work well for my patients. Um, several landed in the hospital. They hated it. There was, you know, feeling of temporal fume and seizures. It just, I wouldn't use it anymore. Oxyhocin, on the other hand, I said, facilitating parasympathetic function is what we want and has been well received in my population. Oxytocin also decreases aggression, territorial aggression, while antidiuretic hormone facilitates territorial behavior. Also, not really something we want um, for most of the general population. Most likely, the effects of oxytocin are through modulation of the autonomic nervous system, leading to improved cardiovascular and inflammatory response, as well as increased vascularization and cerebral blood flow. What I'm trying to say here is not the oxytocin so much causing all the benefits we're seeing. It's oxytocin improving the balance of your vagal, your parasympathetic and sympathetic tone, which then leads the rest of the body to do what it's supposed to do to produce health. And that's my working theory of the improvements I quite regularly see, which can't quite be explained by the short half-life in the body. And that's important for me to understand because people have queried me as like, well, how could a trochee work? It you know, can't get through the blood-brain barrier. It can't work. And I'm saying, but I, I definitely see it working. So who I 
suggest dosing is just using it as oral as a trochee. I start at 60 international units for most. You can increase to 100 at night if it's helping sleep or frequent urination, but not quite enough. And in patients, quite often it's postmenopausal with known PTSD. I found using 100 twice a day to increase resiliency in POTS um, with, again, no noted side effects. Although oxytocin helps sleep, especially deep sleep, it doesn't put you to sleep the way, say, a benzo or melatonin does. So you can take it during the day without feeling sleepy, what people notice who take it during the day is when they're upset, they just find it easier to basically count to 10 and relax. You have to understand how wonderful that this is not a controlled substance, doesn't cause dependency, can put people in the vagal tone that we know is healthy for them, and is affordable and available and incredibly safe to use. The safety is this is FDA approved, it's it's for cardiovascular, renal disease, eclampsia, preeclampsia, premature rupture of membranes. FDA has completely approved oxytocin. The side effects that are important to remember, possibly there's an association with prostate cancer. It's correlation, as far as I can tell, not causation. Given how anti-inflammatory oxytocin is, I feel the higher levels of oxytocin found in people with prostate cancer may simply reflect the body's attempt to reduce prostate inflammation, but I do mention it to men. And in settings of danger, oxytocin can essentially go the wrong way. It can function like vasopressin and increase fear signaling. Two things is why I very rarely see this is people are taking it at home in the safest place they know. I ask people don't take it on the road in a strange place or don't take Take it the night you find out that you found you have mold in your home. But also in mold, no one has antidiuretic hormone. I've measured that for years. I can't find it. So I'm not sure how oxytocin would, would be, you know, able to increase it so quickly. So in general, I have very rarely, although a couple of times, um, have seen oxytocin increase more of the stress response. But for the most part, everything works the way it's supposed to. I've just noticed patients may note increased nightmares, anxiety. Sometimes I have it like doing low-dose naltrexone, take it in the day, not at night. And again, if people notice that they're really getting more anxious on it, we simply stop and, you know, and it goes away very quickly. And I do tell patients, if that happens to you, all we've done is show that you do not perceive your current environment as safe. And so we need to keep working on safety so you can take something that will help you even more with safety. And oftentimes just waiting till severe stress passes is enough. Since I've been prescribing it so widely in my population of really sensitive patients, I've seen idiosyncratic responses. I just cannot explain like pain in the arm that just doesn't make sense to me, except, hey, something with mast cells is going on. Let's just stop it, retry it again, retry it at a different time, work on stabilizing mast cells more, et cetera. That's the best response I have is that there are people who may have noticed sensations in their body they associate with oxytocin. Stopping it seems to stop it and um, there is no harm done and it doesn't mean you don't try it again in a safer time, safer place. And I just bring up low-dose naltrexone, which is also a glial cell modulator. It has a lot of anti-inflammatory um, benefits, um, and I use it quite frequently, especially post-COVID with many patients. And combining these two, I think, is synergistic, extremely helpful, and a winning combination for a lot of people who will thank you um, for getting them into a state that they know they would like to be in. Um, so I believe it's synergistic, and this is a basic protocol for low-dose naltrexone. Nothing new here, except the sensitive patients, I think I've begun to understand. The ones we have to start at 0.25, and I've had pharmacies call me and say, essentially, Dr. Ackley, do you know what you're doing? Did you mean like 2.5? you are starting, at, it's like, yes, I meant 0.25. Is yeah. those patients, A, do benefit by getting up to 0.75, and they almost always have some sort of infection, usually Lyme, and I think it's a microglial activation or basically a Herx issue. The combination 
with now lipoic acid has been shown to help neuropathy. I feel it helps small fiber neuropathy, which is really common in the population we're talking about, is part of the reason we have decreased cerebral blood flow to the brain is the small fiber neuropathy, as well as mass cell. And so I use this combination pretty frequently, trying to improve small fiber neuropathy. And thank you for listening.